Atlantis of Hellas, Vale of Isis, Dionysian Athens, the solar philosophy of Socrates and the Dionysian revels of Asbades. Plato the aristocrat did not like the freedom and liberty which the nature religion of the Dionysian night allowed to the rabble masses of the Athenian population. Plato and his master Socrates preferred the more strict and ascetic order of the sun's bright beauty to the ancient and gloomy practices of Nix. Even in Periclean Athens there was still a great public struggle being waged between the armies of the sun and the moon. Because, it seems, this was an eternally topical question for human community, the need for social order versus the need for variety and liberty. While the aristocratic Plato escaped proscription by the Athenians for having his heretical solar views, his great master Socrates did not. Socrates was executed by the democracy of Athens for attempting to undermine the popular state religion of Dionysus, while his friend, the successful strategos Alcibiades, was reviled by his enemies for holding sacrilegious celebrations of the mysteries at an aristocratic symposium party. The division between sympathizers of the solar order and the mystics of shadowy liberty was endemic within Greek society, causing not only religious strife, but helping to cause the major political altercation of the Peloponnesian War. Did Plato have Spartan sympathies? His own description of an ideal political state makes it sound much like the Spartan society was organized. And this raises the question of what was the most popular and prevalent form of religion in Sparta. Pericles, the great leader of the Athenian democracy, built the temple of the night goddess Athena atop the Acropolis, sparing no expense from the empire's dominions of the sea. Was there a similar religious fervor animating the Spartans of Lacedaemon, and if so, was it the beauty of their solar ordered serfdom? Plato's purpose with the Republic is to devise a new system of government to replace the unruly democracy of Athens. The democracy of Athens was believed to have become unmanageable by some of the upper class oligarchy who had ruled Athens previously. These were the richer families of the state who held the most property. Plato was of the political party that favored a return to a more conservative form of oligarchic rule by placing limitations on the more liberal democracy that had developed and ruled Athens. There was more than this to the internal political machinations at Athens, though, there was also an endemic religious quarrel that was inflaming the society of Hellas 
and helping to splinter the relations between the major power blocks of Athens and Sparta. Alcibiades was, like Plato and Pericles were, a member of the wealthy oligarchic class that had ruled Athens politically and economically since its emergence from the Dark Ages. The difference between them, it seems, was a difference of religious belief, whereas Plato was a believer in the new solarism that was attached to the Apollonian Olympic worship, Alcibiades must have favored the more ancient practices of the unholy nocturnal Dionysian cult. This was the reason Socrates was given over to the attempt of instructing the impressionable politician and strategos in the worship of the new solarism popular among some of the oligarchs. For Alcibiades was more than a successful military leader, he was also a nephew of the leading democratic liberal of the era, the popular leader of the assembly, the visionary demagogue Pericles. It was this maternal uncle of Alcibiades that led the liberal democracy of Athens through much of the war with Sparta in the middle of the century. The new temple of the night goddess Athena was a building project envisioned and supervised by Pericles, and it was he who made the Delian League into an empire when Athens took over control of the League's monies and transferred its treasury to a safe fund within the sacred shadows of Athena's gaze. Knowing this, it becomes easier to understand the social activities of Alcibiades and his famous proclivity for carousing hijinks in the nightlife of Athens while there were peaceful lulls in the war with Sparta. Besides his close relationship with Socrates, there stands out one rather notorious episode from the war years that had a far-reaching, rippling effect upon history. One day, as the proposed Athenian expedition to Sicily was being considered in the assembly, the citizens awoke to find that many of the Hermae throughout the city had been the subject of a most heinous sacrilege. Their erectile penises had been cut off. Someone had to be identified as the culprit for this great atrocity, and a rumor was begotten that Alcibiades had given one of his wild symposium parties that same evening. Not only that, but the supposed party had also been the occasion of further additional irreligious miscreants. It was said that Alcibiades had performed the sacred unholy rites of the dark goddesses at some point that same night before the sacred Hermai had been castrate. That was enough, and the unfortunate Strategos of the planned Sicilian expedition was held to be responsible for the erotic mutilations as well as the travestying of the sacred mysteries at his importune dinner revelry. The important question here, it seems, is if Alcibiades might do such a thing. Perhaps he had given a symposium that very same evening. That much could be determined rather easily, because it could be imagined that someone as prominent as Alcibiades was should have had many dinner guests attending. 
could some rites of the Dionysian mysteries have been performed? This is very possible, though exactly which ones, of course, were not mentioned. That Alcibiades might have damaged the Hermi with some of his drunken party guests later that night after his high society dinner was finished and winding up seems most improbable. The god Hermes was an intrinsic divine celebrant in attendance at the rites of Demeter. This god was also most likely known to be another form of the god Eros. That someone of Alcibiades' position within the state and a believer in the nocturnal religion and a close relative and friend of Pericles might damage the Hermi of this god in such a horrendous and irreligious fashion seems most improbable. Even if you consider the fact that myth made Hermes an unsatisfied suitor of a priestess of the goddess Athena, it still seems highly unlikely that a leading politician in general might make such a risky, drunken improvisation. Instead, what might have occurred was a disguised attempt at forestalling the Sicilian expedition which had been lately put forward to the assembly by Alcibiades himself. The scenario of that infamous evening might have included some sort of planned reenactment of the Eleusinian rites presided over by Alcibiades. So much seems to fit his character and habits. Partaking of the rites and their lack of inhibitions may have been something that was a usual feature of his giving symposiums for those of a liberal leaning. Those who had opposed his sponsorship of the Sicilian invasion might have seen his dinner revels as an opportunity for plotting a devious ploy to circumvent by utilizing his known dissolute lifestyle. The Hermi may have been an irresistible erection of the night to the oligarchic plotters who hoped to sever Alcibiades from the assembly. The wildly chaotic, drug-induced, drunken orgies falling upon dinner at the house of the promiscuous general may have seemed perfect for some sort of masked subterfuge to be undertaken. One very unfortunate casualty of the plot against Alcibiades was the execution of his close friend and mentor Socrates. Because Socrates was a solarist philosopher, the incident was taken advantage of by the Dionysian liberals to implicate him in the disgrace of his friend and student. This may have been a sort of revenge for what was known to be a plot against Alcibiades. Socrates was condemned to death by the assembly for preaching against the gods. At Athens this was the same as preaching against the Dionysian gods of night. These events surrounding the mutilation of the Hermi indicate that the citizenry of ancient Athens were somewhat divided in their beliefs and that they were also separate from their own leading politicians by a certain amount of intervening distance. The distancing of the assembly's leaders from the citizens en masse may often have been caused by lineage of social position or wealth or popularity. 
Another important thing to be noticed in the aftermath of the Hermide intrigue was the difference in result that was given out to Socrates and Alcibiades. While the citizen philosopher Socrates was forced to take poison and die, the popular oligarch general Alcibiades was given leave to lead the invasion of Sicily. The other difference between Socrates and Alcibiades that could have explained their different fates after the Hermite intrigue was obviously that of religious partisanship. Socrates was a famous proponent of solarism and Alcibiades must, of course, have been a Dionysian. The Dionysian members of the assembly, who must have formed by far the greatest proportion of it, then did obviously have some inkling that it wasn't Alcibiades who had made the Hermi castrate. Thus, the Strategos was later, after his eventual roundabout return from Sicily, merely prescribed for having made celebrations of the mystery rites at a symposium party. Socrates, on the other hand, being a known solarist philosopher prophet with oligarchic links to many upper class worshippers of Apollo and the Olympian gods was opportunely done away with. The idea even occurs that perhaps after the Sicilian expedition was launched a counterplot may have been devised whereby the Dionysian Liberal Party planned the placement of Alcibiades at Sparta as a high-level spy. This could help explain the eventual ease of his return to Athens following his seemingly traitorous service with the Spartans, at which he led the Dionysian annual sacred procession from Athens to Eleusis. Besides the political struggle between the market capitalist democracy of Athens and the communistic monarchy of Sparta, and the religious struggle between the Dionysian night and the Apollonian day that was regional as well as intrasocial, there was an economic, political, and social divide between peasants, ordinary citizens, and the oligarch families. And, as if this were not enough, there was an enormous foreign element looming menacingly near the fractured Greek world. The Persian Empire, with all of its population, wealth, and territorial dominions, was pressing ever westward. The Persian Empire was particularly noteworthy for its innovation in religion, because the Persians were followers of a new belief system that had recently been revealed to the prophet Zarathustra, who was also called Zoroaster. Zarathustra's religion was Zoroastrianism, and this was a solarist form of religion evolved from the old Persian paganism of nature. Zarathustra claimed to have had revelation from the real one god of creation named Ahura Mazda. The sun and fire and light were similar to this Ahura Mazda who was primarily solarist in his dogma to humans. Ahura Mazda had an enemy though this was an evil god named Ahriman, and it was this Ahriman that made nature an unpleasant place to live. 
For the Dionysians of the ancient religion of night, there was then danger threatening from all sides, and it was not merely an internal Greek struggle against the ascetic forces of the day and the sun and the light. The Republic of Plato is one of the pillars of European philosophy, and it is a solaris treatise that speculates upon the best form of government. Plato thinks that government should be managed by the few most wise for the underclasses of the state. The few greatest in wisdom who are to oversee the state apparatus are, of course, solarist philosophers. That this is so can be understood easily from reading his great dialogue. What Plato thinks of the Dionysians of Nix can be gathered from the following extract in which he ridicules the beliefs of a mythic prophet of night who was named Musaeus. Still grander are the gifts of heaven, the night sky, which Musaeus and his son vouchsafe. They take them down into the world below, where they have the saints lying on couches at a feast, everlastingly drunk, crowned with garlands. Their idea seems to be that an immortality of drunkenness is the highest meed of virtue. But about the wicked there is another strain. They bury them in a slaw in Hades and make them carry water in a sieve. Also, while they are yet living, they bring them to infamy. Nothing else does their invention supply. Such is their manner of praising the one and censoring the other. Plato, Republic. Here Plato claims that the Dionysians think of the wicked as water carriers who like to mix water with their wine. When the souls of the dead go down to hell, these wicked water carriers are forced to carry their water in a sieve that is constantly leaking. The idea here is that the fortunate souls in hell all drink their wine neat, or nearly neat, and do not add water to it, which thereby mistakenly reduces its unholy potency. He also claims that the Dionysians think of the underworld as a great big party where they get drunk and wear flowers while reclining on couches as at a Greek symposium. He is correct in this view mostly. The underworld of hell must be a paradise, so whatever you think most pleasurable on the earth of nature, you can imagine as having the spiritual joy you shall receive in paradise. A Dionysian might say here, what difference does it make what the source of your joy is in paradise? The earthly joy may only be similar to the paradisical joy, but what difference, and does it matter? The unsaintly demons of hell are not everlastingly drunk. They are very frequently tripping on LSD at the endless communion party of the zoo. But they do like the more potent wine. They only happen to be drinking the pure wine as a scarlet means of refreshment at the Elysian party of souls. But most extraordinary of all 
is their mode of speaking about virtue and the gods. They say that the gods apportion calamity and misery to many good men, and good and happiness to the wicked. And mendicant prophets go to rich men's doors and persuade them that they have a power committed to them by the gods of making an atonement for a man's own or his ancestor's sins by sacrifices or charms with rejoicings and feasts. And they promise to harm an enemy whether just or unjust at a small cost with magic arts and incantations binding heaven the night sky as they say to execute their will and the poets are the authorities to whom they appeal now smoothing the path of vice with the words of Hesiod vice may be had in abundance without trouble the way is smooth and her dwelling place is near but before virtue the gods have set toil Plato Republic Plato is describing the ancient proselytizers who came to his door seeking remuneration in return for their religious services sounds as if Plato the oligarch was annoyed by their frequent solicitations that offered to provide personalized magic rites and ceremonies for the individual believer. The prophets he speaks of here are obviously necromancers sent out of Tartarus and the depths of Avernus as can be seen by his mention of them some while after this. The wealthy worshipper of Apollo doesn't seem to think there is any benefit to be gained by having Dionysian magic rites performed, since most usually these were merely dull, festive productions which involved the ecstasy and joy of nature's indulgence and her fruitful harvest abundance. Plato thinks this because he only values the supernatural and ordered realm of reality of pure thought and spirit that was theorized to exist beyond the orbit of the moon, near to where the sun did emanate hot complex form into the impure ever-changing mass of dirty soupy molecules that lay far beneath and composed the earth. One possible explanation of this passage that might possibly have caused Socrates or Plato to misinterpret the popular beliefs of the Dionysians is what must have been their dramatic philosophy of a neutral nature of existence. Drama could have had its start as a religious evocation of the human situation within the magic drama of existence. The god, actors, and chorus portraying a model of the greater natural reality. The religion of night must have believed the gods to be most ever neutral towards human existence, though for an important reason. The nature gods of the night did not interfere with human existence, at least on a macro level, because to do so was ultimately equivalent to a divine denial of human freedom. What the priests of Dionysus and Demeter Nix, actually believed was that vice and virtue exist only in the soul of the individual. Therefore, by changing the perception of the populace, could virtue be multiplied. This was one of their real intentions for the magic arts and incantations binding heaven, 
the night sky. The other intention of their magic arts was due to a pious regard of nature which could not, very most often, be swayed by them anyhow, though it did help the believers in the magic area of the psyche that was mostly unperceived by the many. The Goddess Demeter, Nix Perception was what they sought to change, and through this the movement of the human psyche. The use of the festive primordial drama as a model of the natural existence is a good instance of this Dionysian goal. Virtue and the good could be furthered by joy and festival instead of by using the Apollonian prescription of complete sobriety in the ascetic. And if this is done, eventually the vice of wrong thinking should diminish with the increasing popularity of belief and worship. Because the universe of nature wasn't a quagmire of evil. The natural was instead a divine creation produced for human life and freedom, a creation that was neutral by necessity. It could be gathered from the mortality of life that this was the situation of existence. The veil held danger for a reason. Natural perfection did not exist, because if it did, mortals might be no more than the pillar columns adorned with the god's mask and attire. Still I hear a voice saying that the gods cannot be deceived, neither can they be compelled. But what if there are no gods? or? Suppose them to have no care of human things. Why in either case should we mind about concealment? Plato, Republic A believer in the religion of night has no worry over such a question. Nature and Dionysus do exist and does care even though there is mostly ever no perceptible interference. And why should you worry if you believe this and are doing nothing false against nature? If God Dionysus does not exist, then existence has no basis or purpose anyhow. So this eventuality should not be of concern, or be worrisome, since life itself then has no worth. Atheism is ultimately and finally nonsensical. Interestingly, an irony is that Socrates said much the same thing, but from the point of view of a solar philosopher and not long before his execution by the Dionysian party of Athens. A difference, though, is that Socrates made no mention of Natura and only regarded a perfection of the starry supernatural as of importance. The Dionysian religion of night leaves it to the individual person to decide what is natural and what is unnatural behavior. Realizing that the God is omniscient and pervading the entirety of the world makes for a substratum of reflection upon one's life and actions. You decide what is proper ethical doings. Freedom, thought, and reflection are given the highest of priorities. 
There are no written regulations preferred to mortals by nature. We only have what we ourselves feel and think, though this does allow for human agreements upon what is possible. Is this the reason Plato is speculating upon the form of his ideal solar utopia? This is the reason why perception and the movement of the human psyche was of great importance to mythic priests like Musaeus. And this leaves it up to the individual to decide upon the existence of God, which is natural and as it should be. But there is a world below in which either we or our posterity will suffer for our unjust deeds. Yes, my friend, will be the reflection, but there are mysteries and atoning deities, and these have great power. Plato, Republic. A belief in the gods of nature makes having evil intentions a difficult idea to achieve, though it doesn't solve the question of what is wicked. While the Dionysians must have left this question to the individual's natural perceptions and feelings of communion with the tribe, Socrates believes the answer is to be discovered through his new dialectic philosophical method of analysis by starting with an obvious given and deducing further logical results from this basis. The method is then carried so far as to determine what type of music style is best for the new utopia, with the idea being that certain emotions and thoughts should be stoically advanced over others by controlling the allowed music styles favored by the state, thus promoting only the perceptions and moods desired in the citizenry. Plato's utopian censorship of music is based upon logic and order to determine what is best, while the Dionysians must have relied upon their own perceptions and inclinations for what pleased them the most and could be gathered from nature. And these, he replied, are the Dorian and Phrygian harmonies of which I was just now speaking. Then, I said, if these and these only are to be used in our songs and melodies, we shall not want multiplicity of notes or a panharmonic scale. I suppose not. Then we shall not maintain the artificers of lyres with three corners and complex scales, or the makers of any other many-stringed, curiously harmonized instruments? Certainly not. Socrates liked to think of the simple and spare as nearly intrinsic qualities of the higher supernatural perfection. This idea came from the theoretical ideal geometry of the element forms believed to compose the lower world of nature. Because the lower sublunar realm of nature was thought to be composed of these geometric solid forms with triangular sides, and the theory was relatively new in Greek lands since being learned or relearned from the then solar priests of Lower Egypt at Heliopolis, solar philosophy made these qualities, along with perfection, nearly equal with being and substance in the otherworldly supernatural realm of the sky above the moon. Although 
Socrates and the Celerus may have been mostly correct about this simple and perfect quality of the supernatural realm and the theory that it was invisible atomic elements much like the nilotic geometric solids that composed the lower realm of nature this does not make the complexity imperfection and transience of the lower order of existent reality and nature inherently bad or evil the natural and supernatural may simply be different realms of existence with no intrinsic qualitative separation between them of what is good and evil the Spartans spoke the Doric dialect of Greek with a spare style of speech and the harmonies of their songs and melodies must have been thought to be similarly so by Socrates and Plato a solarist might have thought the Spartan music with its simple and spare harmonies most nearly like a music of supernatural perfection a spare and well-ordered song or melody might have been thought most like a production from Apollo the god of order and harmony and the Olympian god of the Sun this spare and simply perfect style of music is compared by Socrates with a more complex and varied style that is most likely somewhat chaotic and Dionysian Socrates even extends his comparison of these preferred and prescribed styles of music to variations in the manufacture of Apollo's own lyre but what do you say to flute makers and flute players would you admit them into our state when you reflect that in this composite use of harmony the flute is worse than all the stringed instruments put together even the panharmonic music is only an imitation of the flute clearly not the flute or the pan pipe must have been particularly excluded by Socrates and Plato because of its mythic invention by the horned god of the hunt who is also the supreme male god of nature in the old religion of Nix this paramour of the Nixian creatrix was known to the Greeks as Pan and Zagreus and somewhat later with the advent of the new Olympian gods as Zeus Adeos or Hades the subterranean Zeus there remained then only the lyre and the harp for use in the city and the shepherds may have a pipe in the country that is surely the conclusion to be drawn from the argument the preferring of Apollo and his instruments to Marcius and his instruments is not at all strange I said not at all he replied and so by the dog of Egypt we have been unconsciously purging the state which not long ago we termed luxurious and we have done wisely he replied Plato Republic 3 Plato is being a solarist with regard to his music taste here he is preferring the music of Apollo to that of the satyr Marcius Marcius was a horned and goat-legged retainer of the Phrygian horned god of the hunt the Phrygians were famous for their worship of the goddess Sibylle 
a goddess who was thought to be equivalent with the goddess Rhea of the Titans. Marcius was thought to be linked with Athena's invention of the flute from stag bones. The myth tells of his finding the flute after it was discarded by Athena, the goddess having disliked the distortion it caused in her features while she played upon it. Since Athena was once another name for the goddess Nyx, and the goddess Sibylle was much like Rhea, having rites that included much eroticism and sensuous worship with horned satyrs such as Marcius, it appears very likely that the flute may have first been an invention of Cretan Atlantis. He even swears humorously with the ironic usage of the dog of Egypt's name. Lord Set Dionysus was a pharaoh dog in one of his creature forms. The dog, jackal, and wolf were thought to be one of the many natural living forms that the god frequently possessed within the world around us humans. The hound was a hunter, an invaluable domestic ally of humanity since before the Neolithic discovery of weed planting. The Egyptian god Anubis preserves the stoner relationship between the Paleolithic hunters of pre-civilization and the jackal dog hound species that came to frequent the cavern entrance. With the god Anubis, Egyptian mythology contains a fossilized history of the beginnings of this most important human relationship with the canine hound. Lord Anu was the name of the first male deity worshipped in the Paleolithic as the horn god of the hunt. Many thousands of years later, Lord Anubis was made an assistant to the god of the dead and the overseer of the embalming process of mummification. In the myths of the dynastic period, the name of Anu, who was the first god of the hunt, has devolved upon Anubis, who was an offspring of Lord Osiris and Lady Nephthys. The religious myths of our primitive Egyptian ancestors shows that they were cognizant of the mystery of existence, the difference in being that is life and death. The hound was intimately linked with the vitality of the daily hunt, and the dog was a guardian of the cavern and the excarnation grounds by night. The Plutonian Cave at Eleusis, Hellas. Another important point that Socrates is making with the dialogue above is that the flute, being an instrument of the goatish god Pan, is thought worse than any other instrument by the worshippers of Apollo. The dialectic is supposed to lead the reader to the analysis that the liberal democracy of Pericles and Alcibiades is thought to be luxurious because it worships the gods of night. And therefore I said, Glaucon, musical training is a more potent instrument than any other because rhythm and harmony find their way into the inward places of the soul on which they mightily fasten, imparting grace and making the soul of him who is rightly educated graceful 
or of him who is ill-educated, ungraceful, and also because he who has received this true education of the inner being will most shrewdly perceive omissions or faults in art and nature, and with a true taste, while he praises and rejoices over and receives into his soul the good and becomes noble and good. Plato, Republic. Plato's solarism is visible once more. Nature is seen as having omissions and faults which make it bad or evil. The sun is the perfect source of the good. The Dionysians of Nix, Demeter, think the opposite mostly. The chaos god nature is the source of good. An earthly existence is neutral at worst. The question is, how could a creation of nature have any faults or omissions? This is an impossibility for Dionysians of night. The natural world is merely neutral and this is what allows such disasters as earthquakes and volcanoes to happen. Lord Dionysus could not produce an existence that did not allow such things to happen because this is veering too much toward perfection, a situation that prevents movement and freedom. A perfect thing has no movement or change or alteration of it. Therefore, dangerous factors within the creation must be allowed to exist so as to preserve freedom of movement and possibility. Nature is and must be neutral. The sun is visible at day and the moon is visible at night. Plato advocates the censoring perversion of musical education so as to match his own erroneous solar religion and he is cynical and elitist about it as well which makes it even more insufferable. Otherwise, what Plato says about the benefits of music education and appreciation are undoubtedly in agreement with the worship of pandemonium's dark gods. Plato seems to be purposefully perverting the religion of the serpent subterranean hell for some reason. And is there any greater or keener pleasure than that of sensual love? No, nor a matter. Whereas true love is a love of beauty and order, temperate and harmonious, quite true, he said, then no intemperance or madness should be allowed to approach true love? Certainly not. Then mad or intemperate pleasure must never be allowed to come near the lover and his beloved. Neither of them can have any part in it if their love is of the right sort. No indeed, Socrates, it must never come near them. Plato, Republic. This passage is almost exactly a comparison of Apollo with Dionysus. Dionysus was the madness of sensual love. Apollo was seen as the beauty of order. Dionysus was also the god of intemperance and pleasure. 
Apollo was harmonious order. Dionysus was variation and exceptional disorder. Plato is definitely, along with Socrates, a solarist. The Dionysian Athenians did execute him for a reason. Socrates was subverting the Dionysian state religion of Athens. Perhaps exile may have been a better solution. Dionysian religion included intemperance and the maddening pleasure of sensual love in its worship. Sex orgies, drugs, and rock and roll. Dionysus was also the nature god of Zoe, the eternal life of the soul in the supernatural underworld. Dionysus, the same as Set, was the lord of the underworld. Zeus Adios was a later form of Zagreus, the Cretan god of the twilight sun. The mystery festivals were then a reversion of the restraints placed upon the bios, this life, and the usual world of the community. Some exceptional extremes of the community and nature were used as in Tantra to transcend this world and gain a vision of the supernatural of the Zoe, the soul. The mass of the worshippers were used to obscure the identity of the bios, make it like unto its eternal and supernatural Zoe self. The use of mass in the nocturnal festivities was a religious accoutrement inheritance from their Paleolithic ancestors who had worshipped near the cavern fire after the hunt. The shaman of the tribe had worn a horned mask to make himself appear as the god of the hunt. The tribes had made their feasts upon the horned creatures that were so plentiful during the prehistoric. The solar horned god of the hunt was not these horned creatures. The horned creatures, such as the auric buffalo, were provided by the god for the tribe's nourishment. Eventually, the solar god had gained the horns of these creatures as part of his own adornment, and so had the shaman. Mass came to be used for the religious attire of worshippers, and some other religious societies within the tribe did start using the mask for rituals and festivities. The dramatic mass of Dionysian festivities are a direct descendant from these prehistoric evenings around the cavern fire. Extreme sensual communions then led to exceptional feelings of sorority and of being one with the eternity of night. The belief in the reincarnation of souls also involved the eventual sexual transmigration of those souls into other bios. The following passage sounds as if it might be Plato or Socrates interpreting their own take on the myth of Eurydice after her snake bite. 
and suppose once more that he is reluctantly dragged up a steep and rugged ascent and held fast until he's forced into the presence of the sun himself. Is he not likely to be pained and irritated? When he approaches the light, his eyes will be dazzled, and he will not be able to see anything at all of what are now called realities. Plato, Republic 7 this is from Plato's Parable of the Cave. Plato and his Solarism. The supernatural is the only real existence. Here Plato is stating his famous assumption that Nietzsche described as not necessarily logical. That it does not follow that the supernatural is definitely the only good and the natural is therefore evil. Nietzsche's point is that good and evil are qualities and they are not by necessity the difference between the natural and the supernatural realms of existence. This was an assumption made by Plato and Socrates based upon their sun worship that does not necessarily reflect reality. Nietzsche's idea was that the natural and the supernatural may be equivalent and the natural may have the same quality as the supernatural with neither being more good or evil than the other. So nature is not bad because the supernatural is good and neither is nature lesser because the supernatural existence follows upon it. This is not by necessity an obvious result based upon what we know of existence, said Nietzsche. Yet Almost all of this philosophical tradition of our civilization is based upon Plato's speculative solar theorem. When he approaches the light, his eyes will be dazzled, and he will not be able to see anything at all of what are now called realities. Plato, Republic, 7. The main problem with Plato's solar supernatural is that it devalues nature based upon an ancient theorem that is not a philosophical given. What if, Nietzsche questions, nature is not somehow worse than the supernatural existence we expect after death? If it isn't, then we could be devaluing this life in a speculative description of the life to follow upon this one. Nietzsche says we are making a bad odds wager by gambling a known existence upon an unknown existence that we aren't sure is better. Nietzsche says there may be no need to gamble away this existence in the first place, even if we are positive the supernatural exists. Because the qualities of good and evil don't have to pertain to either of them, existences may simply be fashioned as neutral. could be that a superior omnipotent being fashioned existences to be neutral so that creatures might have the utmost freedom. Perhaps the one God 
values freedom above every other quality and does not wish to interfere with absolute power. Programmed obedience supplied to a creature by an omnipotent creator, God, might not achieve very much. When Nishi said, beyond good and evil, what he meant was, is don't think of the supernatural as the good and as being somehow opposed to an evil of nature, because this may not be so, especially since the same creator made each of them. It is possible and may be likely that Socrates and Plato got their idea of an illusionary reality within nature from Dionysian religion. Plato thinks of the solar supernatural as being of a higher form of reality, which the supernatural could very well be though he may have gotten this idea from the religion of night and the cult of Dionysus. Drama may have been a ritualized method of displaying the illusionary surface of reality to the audience. Nature as an illusion of reality produced by the God within which the deity moves. The mask of the actors were then from the religious festivals. He will require to grow accustomed to the sight of the upper world. And first he will see the shadows best, next the reflections of men and other objects in the water, and then the objects themselves. Then he will gaze upon the light of the moon and the stars and the spangled heaven, and he will see the sky and the stars by night better than the sun or the light of the sun by day. Certainly. He will then proceed to argue that this is he who gives the season and the years and is the guardian of all that is in the visible world and in a certain way the cause of all things which he and his fellows have been accustomed to behold. Clearly, he said, he would first see the sun and then reason about him. Plato, Republic, 7. Apollo, the sun god, has become like unto the mainland Egyptian solarist gods such as Horus and Ra. This is the belief of Socrates and Plato, and it may come directly from the priestly college of Heliopolis in Egypt. And Plato's description of the upper world is most interesting in its description of the night sky, the stars, and the moon. Plato makes these gods of the religion of night into lesser illuminaries of his solar upper world of the supernatural. This is the same view of night and the moon that is found in mainland Egyptian solar theology. And if they were in the habit of conferring honors among themselves on those who were quickest to observe the passing shadows and to remark which of them went before and which followed after 
in which were to gather, and who were therefore best able to draw conclusions as to the future, do you think that he would care for such honors and glories, or envy the possessors of them? Plato, Republic, 7. Plato is here comparing, falsely, the natural world with the supernatural world. The natural world is seen by Plato as being a mere realm of shadows as compared with the supernatural other world of existence. So, the world of nature was a world of some illusion when compared with the realities of the supernatural. The illusionary quality of the natural world was then due to its being fashioned by the one God who was the creator of all things. This belief in a divinely made illusionary world of nature was also a common belief held by the believers in the religion of night. The worshippers of Nyx and Dionysus thought the world to be divinely inspired by the moving spirit of the gods God, within the phenomena of nature, and this was the reason for some of its illusionary beauty and sublimity. An important point here is that the natural world is divinely inspired and made. This does not mean, however, that the world is actively controlled by the God so as to achieve certain results of more than a passing note. The world is like the notes of a flute player, a satyr, the movement of Dionysus within the phenomena of the world has no substantial effect. His notes are a mere veneer of artistry that are only visible or audible to a mystes initiant. The veil of Isis may only be perceived a wisp after a person has awakened from their sleep of dramatic reality. The real world of nature does not then become a utopia afterwards though. The wisp of perception only comforts one in a mere elusive fashion of sheer transient moments that are divided by long periods of drama realism. The illusion moves some, though only slightly. The movement of natura is in substance without the intention of making a difference to the illusion of the drama. Isis shall always remain neutral within this existence. The actual most real quality of this nature was one of a null neutrality and the drama was to the audience the same as the cavern shadows were to Plato's cave dwellers, or the natural world was to human existence. Apollonian and Dionysian belief were the same, except the Apollonians worshipped gods of the day instead of the gods of night was one very important difference. The Dionysians highly valued this existence of nature, 
whereas the Apollonians did not value it. Why did the Dionysians value the illusion that was nature? Because it was only an illusion for mortals produced by the God. For humans the illusion of nature was reality. The deity understood the scientific magic that made nature function, but we most often could not. In other words, the divine illusion of nature was so real for lesser beings like us mortals that it made no difference that it was actually an illusion produced by the God. Humans are so involved with living that we don't have the opportunity, usually, to stop and think of the scientific functioning of the natural reality. Art and science are similar religious perceptions of Isis. Modern science is a sort of magic. Art is how we perceive this world of nature. This is the great philosophical rupture that Nietzsche describes in his writings. In the history of Greek philosophy after this momentous break in thought became almost entirely of an Apollonian solar belief.